What a treat. Uh, the first film, uh, artist talking about an, another artist. I, was, I thought about Michael Amoriti's film about uh, Eccleston, uh, who also does a voiceover that's uh, very poetic and, and uh, engaging. And, uh, I really liked uh, what you were doing there. And then the, the second film I can't remember. Um, I remember you uh, show the sprocket holes, and I think maybe I, I um, thought that was a bit nostalgic. Uh, uh, and then the third film, I thought I should have made that film. Uh, <laughs> you were in my Southwest, a, a beautiful film. Uh, and then the fourth film uh, outdid the... Uh, the Beatles' rooftop movie, uh, <laughs> uh, by far, and w what a demonstration of duration. Really moving. I think that's the film you were afraid people would maybe leave the theater on. I think it got <laughs> the largest applause. And then the last film brought me back to uh, the history of New York, or whatever the title that of uh, the first uh, film that I saw of yours. Uh, um, so I, I, it's such a, a great uh, variety of work, uh, yet it all has, it's all made by you, I can tell it. It has a, uh, a particular care and uh, uh, beauty in the image making. And, uh, they're really Jim Cohen films. Well, thank you, James. Um, you know, w one of the reasons why I... I'm happy to do this Q&A with you is actually because I do I want to publicly um, acknowledge what your work has meant to me uh, in some regards it's it's obvious after that screening but it's it's also um, you know th th there's a thing that happens that I really love that is everywhere all over the planet that everybody does and everybody sees, which is that people stare off into space. Like you can most commonly sort of see it if you're like waiting for a tram or you, you see it in a library or whatever, but pe people do it everywhere. Like they, they stop and they just look and they listen and they space out and they daydream. But then you have uh, cinema, which is often kind of the opposite of that. And, and then, you know, when I was quite young, I saw work by Peter Hutton and you, and I realized, like, here's this thing that's very human, but it somehow has been, like, elbowed out of the movies. But it's okay. Like, it's a language that people speak, and they, they speak it, uh, certainly in your case and, and Peter Hutton's case as um, as masters of that language and so it was it was very important to me to <laughs> to see that and feel like okay, yes it's a language like it's okay you can <laughs> so yeah anyway it's, it's obviously a heavy uh, beautiful thing for me to talk about but I thank you for that. Um, yeah. uh, you me mentioned Peter, and there's a reference to Peter in the first film. Uh, uh, Peter uh, taught at Bard and lived across the river and down a bit from uh, where uh, um, Guston's studio was. Uh, and across the street, the river from where Peter lived was a, a, a brick factory, and I think it had some connection to Hutton itself, and you show a, a brick that has Hutton in it. So. Yeah, I'm very glad you saw that. I mean, it's like a secret moment of tribute. Um, I mean, I, I, I was working on the Gustin piece, and I had bricks in my mind, and, <clears throat> and then I was... Uh, uh, when I'm upstate, I'm, I often think about 
Peter, and, and, when, and I remembered that there was a brick factory, so I went to go get a shot of a brick, and then I, I saw that his name was actually on them. Um, so that, that's just a little tip of the hat, but I'm very, I'm very glad that you saw that. Yeah, I own one of those bricks. <laughs> um, and then at the, at the end of the film, uh, the first film, there you have, um, you tell uh, some of the people that own his work, and one of them was a friend of mine whose name I can't remember, who's a gay artist woman, uh, Ronnie Horn. Ronnie Horn. Uh, and... I, I thought that's really interesting. Who uh, Ronnie's a, a really um, successful American artist, and uh, bec because she's so successful, she can afford to collect collect art. And it's interesting that she would have one of his pieces. I think there's. Well, she has a very gutsy one. She has the one that's the back of the bald head and that clan figure, and that's the one I. And his ear is like a C. And that's the one I put in that little moment about white complicity. So it, it, it's, I, it, yeah, it amazed me when I found out that she owned that. I don't know her, but it, yeah. it's, a, it's kind of a gutsy piece to, yeah. <laughs> to own. It's not, a, it's not decorative, shall we say. Um, Gustin, there's been a lot of controversy. I don't know if you're aware of it. In a way, it's talked about too much. But there, there were four major retrospectives that were meant to open in, in the last few years. And, um, and they, there was a kind of institutional panic that they felt that people might not be able to handle the, the Klan references, which is in a lot of ways absurd, but it's particularly absurd because Gustin was very anti-racist and in a way, way ahead of his time in, in making paintings that had something to do with this idea of, of uh, complicity. Um, but the institutions just got freaked out and they postponed the show and luckily it's, it's, it's back on but there was a lot of um, hand-wringing about this issue and that I, I've loved Gustin's work for a long time. I've wrestled with it for a long time. Um, but I also feel like uh, well, like it says in the film, like that freedom is <clears throat> is at the heart of why some people have to do what what they do. And yeah, what had happened was um, um, the, it was those shows were planned, uh, and then um, Black Lives Matter, which first had very little support gained support uh, after a number of incidences of, of cops killing black people. And finally, uh, Black Lives Matter had some, some clout, and then these museums were afraid that to take on this issue when this issue really needed to be taken on. So rather than uh, join the issue, they backed off from it. Uh, and a number of artists uh, uh, signed a letter that was published uh, in... Many, many of the major black artists, yeah. um, which is, you know, indicative of... I mean, I, I think I, a lot of those artists were like, whoa, wait a minute, like, I like this painter, and I was looking forward to seeing that yeah. work. And the discussion it would bring yeah. about, but uh, uh, it's that kind of liberal thinking that... But the paintings carry on, and the work carries on, and I mean, in a way, like I didn't want to have that be the core discussion of my film because it's a it's a little bit of a distraction. I mean, it's a it's an iconography that he wrestled with in this very interesting way, but it's one of of many things that that he did, and I think that it's um, you know it's hard to make a film about a painter because you know that the film can't depict the paintings, that there's nothing that will replace being in front of a painting in person and that that's where it really happens. And you can make a film that sort of registers the work and, and, and thinks about it, but you can't, you can't be there with the painting. Um, and so I was trying to find a way to 
talk about him and his life and talk about uh, my feelings about not just his work, but really about art, art making and, you know, musicians and my friend Vic and, and um, all of that was kind of buzzing around in my head, but I didn't, I didn't know what I would make until I was in it. And I, it, you know, I'm still sort of surprised that <laughs> that's what came out, but it, it really kind of poured out of me and I didn't. Would, uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you got access to the things that are in the film and how, how you were able to copy paintings, if those were photographs that were available or if you actually shot some of them yourself? Right. Well, um, I, I, was, I was initially actually approached by one of these large institutions that was doing, going to do a Gustin retrospective, and um, someone there knew some of my work, and they said, hey, would you be interested in doing a short film about Gustin? And I, and I, and I, I said, absolutely. You know, I, I, I love his work, although I find it very strange and very challenging. And then when the controversy happened, the gig went away, <laughs> and... and and I was also, uh, I'd lost all of my jobs when the pandemic hit and I really needed the gig. So I was, it wasn't a lot of money, but it was, it was, I was kind of, you know, sad on a number of fronts that I'd lost, lost it. And so, but I'd, I'd been thinking about it at that point for six months or so and um, looking at a lot of his work. And I just decided that I wanted to, to do it anyway, even if it wasn't going to be um, a, a commission. So... I realized that there was no proceeding on anything having to do with it if I didn't get the permission of of his daughter who runs the the foundation and the estate. So I just went and had asked if I could have a meeting with with them and um we you know I thought it would just be kind of a brief introduction where I would say that I was interested in someday making a film about Gustin but we ended up talking for a long time and and finally you know since there wasn't that much money involved, you know, they, they very kindly said, you know, what, what are you looking for? And, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's not a great idea to get tangled up with these institutions because they're going to be wanting to sort of have you do something that's somehow useful to them. And the, 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 the programmer at, at the initial commissioning museum was actually very kind and he was heartbroken that the show was postponed. Um, so he encouraged me to to, to move forward, and um, so they they gave me permission, and and I there happened partly in response to the shows being postponed. Uh, they put up a show specifically of some of the most controversial works, which were the sh the works from that 1970 Marlboro show. Mm -hmm. So they put that up in New York, and I went and filmed at the show, and then I had to ask for many many reproductions, which. Um, you know, they, they let me use, and I still haven't really sorted out all of the clearances and rights issues, which is partly why this screening is a special preview, because I have to figure some stuff out. But anyway, I, that's, that's how it happened. Um, and, and how long did it take you, or how did you establish the beautiful text that you wrote? Well, the thing was that I didn't, you know, I didn't quite know what approach I would take, and but I was spending a lot of time upstate, um, and I was sitting by a lake quite near his home and studio, um, and I was just thinking and making notes, and 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 about half of that text just just came out of me right then and, th and there, and I was like, I looked at it, and I was like. <laughs> what are you doing? Like this is this is a really weird way to like write something because I wasn't. I mean, I knew from researching Gustin. There's a lot of very very good writing mm -hmm. on him. Dory Ashton is terrific, and Harry Cooper is terrific, and there's there's a, there are a lot of very good art historians who've written about Gustin in, in much greater depth and intelligence than than I can do because that's not my that's not my gig. And what what it, what I started to write, you know, was in a weird way kind of a prose poem. I mean, it was kind of a song and I was like when I looked at it, I was like like you can't 
you can't do that. <laughs> like, you're not a poet, and you don't, like, what a terrible idea. So I started, I tried to rewrite it as a more kind of, like, normal expository text about him. Mm-hmm. And I kept trying, and it kept, it just kept, like, going back in this direction. And finally, I was like, like, <laughs> this is what, you, this is what you're doing. Like, mm-hmm. so that it was very, it was very odd. Yeah. I'll just ask one more question sure. because I'd like the audience to be able to talk with you. Um, please tell me that the two guys on the road are the two guys on the roof. Um, they're not the two guys, but one of them is the same. And really? It, yeah, oh, yeah. wow, so, that's done. Yeah, let me just explain who the musicians are and like, so I can link some of this together. So Jim White uh, does one of the drum pieces that's in the Gustin film. Uh, He's got a new solo record that's going to come out that has some of that on there. He uh, is in a band called Dirty Three in Australia. He's Australian, and they're a wonderful band that I've admired for many years. Um, But now he most frequently plays with an absolutely incredible lute player from Crete, Yorgos Zilores. So Zilores White is their duo. And uh, those are the two guys walking on the road in Texas. Um, And uh, Jim also has this other duo with this guy, Emmett Kelly. And one day, Jim, I I talked to him pretty frequently, and he he said, I've got a new beat. I've got a beat. (laughs) And I was like, what what do you mean? And he's like, yeah, I've got this beat. I think me and and Emmett are just going to play this thing and just see how it goes. And they, they play it usually for about an hour, 45 minutes or an hour. And Jim is an extraordinary drummer who can really do kind of anything. I mean, I, I've, I've been involved with a lot of musicians, and he's a wonderful, very interesting drummer. And they, you know, he said, well, we're going to play on a rooftop in Brooklyn. You should come and shoot it. You know, and it was a party. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like a, I was, you know, they didn't ask me to, like, make a music video or something it was just they just said you should come and you know and I was going to be there anyway so I talked to a few people who were already going and asked a few people if they would grab cameras and shoot and so that was a a, just a document of an actual event um I didn't get the whole 45 minutes that they played that evening I, I this is what I got so I had to come in where I came in um and then I just I put it on the shelf for a couple of years because I didn't really know what what to do with it or what to make of it, but um, that, that's what I did with it. Um, and, and then, uh, let's see, what else? Oh, yeah, so Jessica is a violinist, Jessica Moss, um, and I've, sometimes I work with, with her and, and Jim and Yorgos, and we had a gig in Texas. Uh, I was, I do these shows that I call Gravity Hill shows where I do, projections and ask musicians to play with them. And um, so we had a gig in Texas together. And then on the last day when we were done with our job, I just said, we, we've, you know, we're leaving tomorrow. We've got to get out to the desert. So once again, there was no intention of making a film. So we, we went out, we just all got in a van uh, in Guy Pichotto, um, who I often work with uh, was the other person, and we we went out to the desert. So those guys were just walking, and I just walked up a hill, and I was started to film, and then I would watch them coming down the road, and it was so beautiful. And I just turned around, and I eventually I I, I just yelled, "Go back! <laughs> Turn around! Go back!" <laughs> and uh, they actually ignored me for a little bit, yeah. and then eventually they turned around. Mm-hmm. And walked back in, and, and I, I could see that my, I can't remember if it was the battery or the camera card was dying. So just, they just made it back in, and the camera got that tiny bit, and then it died. Is it, is it in West Texas near Marfa? Yeah, yeah. So that's, what, that's what, what got us out there. So all of these projects tend to come about, um, you know, kind of pretty much non-commercially. I mean, I... I I've I've done music videos in the past, and I've always had a problem with the industry. It and it used to be a way that I thought I could 
you know, make a living or some, or, or help, it would help me make my other films. And then it, it be, always became very um, kind of miserable dealing with the record labels and the sort of industry and side of it. And I didn't, I didn't do commercial work. And, and so it was, it was kind of a, a mixed blessing. And then that kind of side of things sort of tanked in the last 10, 15 years. And now, you know, sometimes I work with people and they ask me if I will do a, a piece for them, like this Black Ox Orchestra that Jessica plays in, which is a, a, a band that usually has vocals in Yiddish. They're kind of serious uh, punk rock scholars of uh, Yiddish music. And they asked me to do a piece, but, you know, these are very, very low budget and they pretty much, I just, you know, do what I what I want to do. And in that, and I often work from an archive of my own footage. And I just went back and I pulled, I remembered that I had gone to this synagogue uh, in the Lower East Side years ago and I pulled out that Super 8 footage and some, one roll of 16 and I transferred it and I made this. And it, and it, it, it is nostalgic. It's, it's kind of shamelessly nostalgic and I have mixed feelings about that in a way. And I, I think in a way you're spot on about the sprockets. Um, because it's an it's a nostalgic music inherently, and it's a nostalgic format now in some regard. Um, but I couldn't fight it again. It was kind of like the Gustin thing. I I realize as I get older that I can kind of make rules for myself, like things that I d wouldn't do or that I don't do. But then when I'm making a film and I break the rules, sometimes I just have to I just have to realize like well. <laughs> you did do that, <laughs> you know, like, you, oh, well, you do do that, because you just did it. And, and then sometimes I have to say that that's okay. Do you know what I mean by that? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I never break rules. <laughs> um, Jim is one of, James Benning is one of the great rule breakers. And when I first knew his work, I made a terrible mistake, which is that I thought, I thought that you were a purist. And then I realized that I, was, I couldn't have been farther away from the actuality, which is that you are a, a, an impurist. <laughs> um, anybody who saw the, the piece that's here, it, it's an incredible kind of summation of that. I won't spoil it. But it's, it's a, this is very interesting to me. Gustin is is an impurist. He, he had to be. He went, and that's exactly, he kind of nailed it um, by saying that, but, that he was tired of, of purity, and, it, and he turned towards the, he, turned, he loved Crazy Cat, he turned towards that, he turned towards terrible things that had happened in his life and in the historical life of, of the world, and he he started to make this work, which was very, at the time that he kind of busted out with it, it was very outrageous, and it upset a lot of people, and he lost friends, and he stopped selling. And I think, but, but I, I, I don't in a, for a minute think that he was rejecting abstraction, which is, a, I think, a mistake that some people have made. And, and I think that that's something that is interesting and beautiful to me and that was a lesson that I also learned a lot about from you was that things can have a certain kind of impure purity <laughs> and that's kind of the country that I like to travel into. And I, I, I think that one of the things that's important about the work that both of you do is that um, in my, it's my impression that when people are staring like that, they're not actually seeing anything. They're in their own world and they're sort of disconnected from, from the space around them and real time and um, they're sort of often, often a narrative, a personal narrative or something. They're, they're reliving their past or they're projecting into the future. Um, and the work that you two do is something which... which um, puts a block on that somehow and, and makes you, as a viewer, it sticks you in the present. And the present might be cinema time, but nevertheless, it's, it's a present. You're there with your own body. Um, you're in a room with everybody breathing. And it's, it's really a sort of... Um, 
it's a, it's an antidote to the to the distraction of everybody and of everyday life that we're all totally kind of um, taken up with. And I think that the um, the band performance was also something which really demonstrated that to me. It was like two guys just doing the same thing more or less over and over and over again. And I was thinking, yeah, when does this stop? When the sun sets? Maybe it doesn't stop when the sun sets. It's kind of film time. I think maybe that's that. And anyway, I think that's that's something that's really interesting. Well, I, I thank you for that comment. I mean, one thing that I'll say is that there's a kind of cinema, there's a kind of movie going where the reaction of, of individuals is going to be very different. And so I think that in, in one regard, you're, you're absolutely right, that people are often like remembering something or, or daydreaming. But, but often I think they also, like they might look at the light on a building while they do that and see that light in a very clear, total way. And, and they're not necessarily antithetical. And there's a kind of cinema where that also is encouraged. Because I don't, I mean, I'm not going to pretend that when I'm watching, I mean, I've seen films of James, James's where it's a 45 minute shot, a single shot, or maybe I, I haven't seen Nightfall or some others that are, I, I've seen some that are an hour, I think, a single mm -hmm. shot. And I'm not going to pretend that I'm only looking at that shot the entire time. My mind will go all, all, all kinds of places. And then it will return. But there's something very mysterious and beautiful in that, in that, um, in the fact that that's allowed to happen or encouraged to happen or that it becomes part of, of what we make and what we can show in, in a cinema. And it's also, you know, like it's important that there are film museums and archives and people who care about projection and sound and masking who also kind of help to make these experiences what they, what they can be. They encourage that thing that we're trying to do by also making it. They also, like, they clear away distractions in certain venues and certain f festivals, frankly. Mm. So th this is part of what we try to look for, what we're, what, or, or I think maybe in a lot of our cases, this, this is something that we, that we need, especially as we are more and more inundated with distraction. That... I agree. <laughs> Anybody else have a question or? comment. I tend to digress and wander a little bit, but you have a follow-up? <laughs> oh. <Hello? laughs> Sorry. Right. Now, the other thing I was going to ask you about was um, the, the, the construction of music videos. And I was wondering if you saw the, um, the work of um, uh, Mathieu Almerich, the, the Zorn um, no, I like haven't. I, I very much look forward to. I would like to see that. They are so good. I mean, and generally it, speaking, I can't stand music videos, and I think well, that this, this is what's interesting about it because it's it's like he's also someone who said, "Well, this is not something that I ever expected to be in a cinema context. It's just something that we, um, Zorn um, and his crew and I, as a single guy, would." He said, "I do all the work." He's lifted up his backpack. This is where, this is my. These are my tools. It's my yeah. sound recording and my camera. And I just go in there and shoot stuff. And it was only meant to be seen um, in, the, in the context of a Zorn concert as a background or something like that or between, between sort of sessions. Um, and it's only as he started to put it all together that he realised, and people were sort of saying to him, oh, you can get this on the screen, that he'd produce something cinematic. And, but the, the fact that he wasn't thinking about it as a music video or a strict documentary or something like that means it has this sort of um, underlying power, which is just about him and the performers, which is just fantastic. I've never seen anything like it. And these pieces of yours really struck a chord from that perspective as well. Like they're, they're put together without this sort of... Well, they seem to me to be put together in the same spirit, where it's not really like, oh, I'm making a music video or I'm not really doing... You know, I'm just... At the party, I've got some cameras. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Well, thank um, you. And the similar thing with the um, the work with the, um, the the last piece. 
It's like, yeah, it's just all, it's, it's loose, it's fragmentary, it just comes together and it it's, doesn't have a storyboard, something like that, you know what I mean? Well, it's also, it's, li it's life, it's my life. I mean, that's, I, you know, that's the B&H dairy where I go to get my borscht. That's the, that's the red of that borscht, it's very particular. And I'm glad that I had a way to document it. <laughs> and I can bring you the soup. <laughs> so we probably have to wrap it up, or very soon. Oh, OK. Thanks, thanks for the program, Jim. And, and thanks for, for the talk between the two of you. Just a quick question. Uh, how happy were you with seeing all of them works together in that program now? Because of course we are talking about individual films, but in a way it's also a program that has its own flow. And was it always intended as a program? No, it, it wasn't. I, I, I felt very good about it. I mean, I, I think in a way that it's a lot to ask of people because it's, there's a kind of strange, I don't know. I mean, maybe, it, maybe I don't know. I, don't know. I, I felt good about it. I felt like there was, a, there was a, a sort of through line or a kind of conversation, even if I would never, it never really would have occurred to me to, to put these all together, but now I might like to do it again. Um, so I, I, felt, I felt pretty good about it. And I, I think it's a great program. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I do want to thank some people, actually, just as we wind up here, because my re relationship with the festival is, is something that I'm thankful for, and with Vienna is, is something that I'm thankful for. Um, and I, I, Bobby's here, who is in uh, Museum Hours. I'm working on a new feature um, that has to do is inspired in large part by the, the Natural History Museum. Uh, Christian is here who was very welcoming. Um, and Barbara and not last, but well, maybe not last because there's other people I'm sure that I should thank, but Paolo Calamita. All of these are people who, um, you know, there's a thing where you, you need like some islands you need some common language, and uh, but also you you need people who can help you get get things done. Because I usually am working very small, and so I just wanted to tip my hat and forgive me if I've forgotten somebody. But thank you, those people I've mentioned. <clears throat> And I'll have the last word while 